Good afternoon. I'm Eric Spangenberg, and as Dean of the Paul Mirage School of Business, I want to welcome you here today and welcome you to the campus to celebrate the life of uh, Dr. Lyman Porter. Um, I don't have a lot to say this afternoon, but I definitely want to express my gratitude for the foundation laid by Port, a base upon which our school and indeed I think management education in general really has has continued to build and, and importantly his research and his training of graduate students is something that he's known for and I knew about him long before I ever met him in person when I came here and, and I'm sure that's the case for many of you. I also owe Port's memory a personal uh, debt of gratitude as he was on the committee that selected me as Dean so that was kind of nice of him. <laughs> and. Uh, I mean, I recall in the interview process meeting him, and I was I was really impressed by how humbly and graciously he welcomed me, and and I, and uh, and you know that that was really a it was really a nice interaction uh, before I even took the job. My only regret is that I really didn't get to know Port better before his passing. We didn't overlap here for long, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity to honor his legacy as dean of the Mirage School, and. Uh, and and so I think I think I'll close my comments with that. I mean, um, we truly do stand on the on the shoulders of giants in many respects, and it's kind of funny because he wasn't a real big guy, but uh, but he was a giant in his intellect and in his, in his personality. And so this afternoon we pay tribute to Professor Lyman Porter. And so I would now like to introduce James McGough, one of the founders of UC Irvine, and a professor in the Department of Neurobiology and, and Behavior. So Dr. McGough. Well, it, it is a, a great privilege for me to uh, have an opportunity to share in honoring the legacy of Lyman Porter. Uh, I have a special relationship with him. You cannot hear me? Is this on? Is this on? Yes. It's not my fault. I was told I didn't need to use the microphone, so don't blame me. I have a um, I have a story about the special relationship that I had with Port. Uh, I believe it is the case. You can raise your hand if you disagree with me, but I knew Port longer than anybody else in the room. Uh, because I met him in 1956. Anybody? All right, so far I'm right. Now the circumstances were interesting because he was a, a newly minted assistant professor at Berkeley and I was a not newly minted uh, graduate student uh, in my later years as a graduate student and I met him then as a professor and I got to know him. Now uh, as a professor in the department, he knew about a uh, problem that I created for myself. The, the interest in seeing that all graduate students would pass two language exams was beginning to wane. Now we don't have any, but I could see it coming. And so I passed my German exam, and I made a bet that uh, there was not going to be a second exam by the time I finished my degree. <laughs> And I lost the bet. <laughs> so uh, at, toward the end of my time there, the graduate dean called me in and said, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is there something you've forgotten about your career here? And innocently, I said, oh, what is that? And he said, well, you didn't take your second exam. So the very last thing that I did to get my PhD at Berkeley was to pass a French exam. It delayed the exam, and it was because I made the bad gamble. Then I discovered from Meredith that passing the French exam was also the last thing that he did. So we had that in common. Now, that I only found that out, but that explains a lot because most of the time when I saw Port, ran into him, and there were a lot of times, he would rib me about my French exam. How's your French coming? Ha, 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 you know? <laughs> They're getting better in French. Do you speak French? There was always a ribbing. And I was delighted to find out that the source of that was not that I failed, but because he did that is the last thing that he did. 
So we had that in common that we failed to 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 learn French together. That's a a, 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 a common learning. Now I remet him uh, again in 1957 when he arrived. I came in 1964. And we met uh, in, the, in the town center over here, the town center to be, there was just one building, and there was a, a Jolly Roger restaurant, which was our faculty club, and I met him in the faculty club, and I looked at him, and I said, I, we've met, you, you, you know, at, at Berkeley, and we agreed that, uh, uh, and also, we lived very near, nearby, I lived in Kensington when I was in Berkeley, and I think you lived in Kensington also, Meredith. So, we got to know each other quite well. Later, I became the uh, executive vice chancellor of the campus here, and, and Port was dean of the uh, of the graduate school of management. And we had a lot of interaction because he was always seeing me, asking for more resources, and telling me how wrong my decisions were about all the things that we did. But we had a we had a very good relationship. Um, I was honored when when I was executive vice chancellor that he would invite me to Meredith and his home to meet with the graduate students to talk about uh, academic administration. And I always enjoyed seeing the graduate students and giving a perspective on administration of a campus because uh, most people don't ask. They just think anybody in that job is probably worthless anyway because who would do something like that? So that was a, a very interesting and important thing to do. I in interacted with them on a weekly basis, and we discussed everything that can be discussed about academic planning. Uh, he always wanted more resources than he deserved to have and, uh, <laughs> and complained bitterly about it, but always in a very uh, pleasant way because he was a very, very pleasant person. I also interacted with him uh, in the American Psychological Association. He and I were members of that organization. And at a time in its history, it was becoming unraveled because it was going in a non-scientific direction. And our background, of course, is science. And so we met on committees also with Dr. Milt Hockel, who was involved in this also. And you'll be hearing from him soon. We were trying to save the organization by keeping its perspective on science and we failed to do that. And so we left the organization and created the Association for Psychological Science, which now has 30,000 members and is doing very nicely. And it was the American Psychological Association, which you have probably read in the newspaper uh, several weeks ago, that gave all of the advice to George Bush about how to torture people because from a psychological perspective, they said it was perfectly okay as psychologists, they said that. Um, that's the organization that, organization that Milt and Port and I left because we felt it was going in the, in the, uh, in the wrong direction. Now, uh, I'm going to say something that is absolutely not novel because everyone who knew Port has the same words to say. Um, he must have been a Boy Scout. I don't know if he was, but he must have been, because there, there is a, uh, something about a Boy Scout who is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind. And that, that was poor. He was trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, and decent. Um, anyone who knew him, everyone who knew him, would characterize him in that way. He was always friendly. He was always nice. He was always helpful. He was always a listener. Uh, even when we would have vociferous arguments about whether I was giving him enough resources, he was always with a smile. That was rare. Most of them had a sneer, an anger in <laughs> voice, but not port. So I just want to say that I, I am, I'm grateful to have known Port for almost 60 years, uh, to have had him as a friend, to have had him as a neighbor, living close by in East Bluff, um, with um, his daughter Anne being a close friend of my daughter Jan over the, the many years, uh, to have worked with him in the um, psychological world, to have worked with him in the organization and planning of the university, and to have known for all these years a very, very decent human being. Thank you.
I'll do it myself. Don't worry. Don't worry. I say it for this year. I say it for this year. The Lord the more the power. I say it for this year. Stay here. Stay here. Uh, now I don't need to, but I need to introduce to you Professor. Sh Since you all, most of you know him, I thought somebody was going to fill it out from a Schoenfeld, who was Dean of the School of Physical Sciences for... Social Sciences. <laughs> Social Sciences. We collapse physical sciences in because we're more scientifically sophisticated. Right, Bill Molson? For, for 20 years, and he interacted considerably with Port, and he's going to give you his perspective. Yes. Willie, it's yours. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Before I begin, I'd like to say two things. First of all, I think like all of you, I'd rather not be here. Uh, we may say certain things to try to laugh and to remember and enjoy, but this is all embedded in something that we do not want to do. And the second preliminary thing I'd like to do is I'd like to thank Meredith and her family for allowing the university to do this, and more importantly, for all those years to have shared your husband and your father with us. Now, being a university professor is perhaps, in my opinion, the consummate liberal profession. In contrast to all others, faculty have enormous freedom as to how to conduct themselves. With little external controls, they decide what they are going to do, how they are going to do it, when they are going to do it. In turn, it is not very surprising that so many faculty behave in ways which seem idiosyncratic. <laughs> In fact, occasionally the professoriate is viewed as a refuge for the unsocialized. <laughs> In this context, it is unusual and surprising to find people who are models of propriety and civility. Lyman Porter was such a person. Not only a true scholar, but also a real gentleman. And a real gentleman by choice not by social pressure, by internal demand, not by external demand, by cause of his character. Now, others will speak of his research. Let me try to touch, albeit briefly, upon his character, drawing on three contexts in which I had the honor to work with him over the years. First, I believe he is actually the person who was the longest-serving dean of the Graduate School of Management, the Business School. I mean, I think he even served longer than Andy Pelicano, <laughs> who in recent history seems the longest, but I think Lyman, Lyman was 11 years, right? Okay. Now, during this period of time, his commitment was systematically towards advancing the interests of the school, its faculty, its students, and its staff. He did this with great energy, with intellectual rigor, and with hard work. None of what he did was designed to advance his own private personal interests. Everything was focused on collective interests. Moreover, he was never combative with his Decano colleagues. Rather, he sought to find common ground in which the university's general interests could be advanced alongside of his school's interests. That was a defining characteristic of his service as dean. Now, being a dean was not only his, the only important service function that he performed, he was also an associate executive vice chancellor charged with the issues of academic personnel. Now, this is an extraordinarily delicate position because this is the position which serves as the connector between, on the one hand, the faculty and the academic administration and their desire to raise salaries and the central administration and their desire to treat the faculty poorly. <laughs> now, Lyman served at this intersection, 
And under all circumstances, it's a challenging one, but he served as a time which was characterized by two other phenomena. First of all, it was a bad budget time. Now remember, this is faculty salaries. If it's a bad budget time, where's the money for the salaries? But secondly, it was a central administration which was not <laughs> especially well-liked by the bulk of the faculty. And so Lyman had to serve as a liaison, an unnecessary liaison, because without getting things done, no one was going to get more salaries. And he did that once again with honesty, with hard work, with seriousness, with fairness. Due to his gentle manner and his deep instinctive civility, he was enormously effective in reducing conflict and in increasing harmony at a very difficult time for the campus. Finally, I mentioned Lyman Porter's one example of his service in a number of more minor and less lofty roles. In recent years, for example, he served as treasurer of the UCI chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. Here he not only showed the character qualities I have already discussed, but also demonstrated his commitment to a traditional liberal arts and sciences education as the proper function of an undergraduate education and the necessary foundation for successful graduate and professional education. This was a position that he held throughout his academic career, and it is a position which has become less powerful, although continues to be absolutely correct. So overall, Lyman Porter was, in my opinion, a model colleague and a model community member. Knowing him and working with him made you feel good about UCI. He made the institution a much better place, not just because of his scholarship, but also because of his character. UCI has been reduced by his passing. We all miss him deeply. Now it's my turn to introduce the next person. And you know, Jim over here, who didn't point out, he's an expert in learning and memory. <laughs> memory. You know, people always study things that they don't know much about. <laughs> They typically study things which are problems for them. Anyway, so it's now my honor to introduce Joan Pierce. Now, those of you here, you know Joan. She was an interim dean of the Graduate uh, School of Management. She was hired originally by Lyman Porter when he was dean. She's been a close, intimate colleague. And I not only know that, but I know Joan Pierce as a fellow gym rat at the 24-hour family fitness across the street. So, Joan, come on up and knock them dead. Yeah, I feel I should be thinner, you know, after... <laughs> <It's me. laughs> alas, alas, alas. Um, thanks, Willie. Uh, I'm, I'm here really to represent... It's, 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 he's right, it's a, not a place that we want to be, but we do want to acknowledge Port, and I'm representing the people he hired here at the Graduate School of Administration, the Graduate School of Management, and the Paul Mirage School of Business. Um, and I want to just say two, th add two things to what these distinguished gentlemen have, have already said, um, because to me they represent the scholarly ideal that, that Port is to me, and also the culture that I believe he has established here. First, um, you'll all hear again, I'm sure, how humble Port was. You all know that. And I have one illustration of that. Um, you know what a distinguished scholar Port is. Um, he uh, was such a big deal in our field that by me knowing that I could call him Port gave me status in my field. It was, he was a very big deal. Um, it was such a big deal, he told me a story fairly recently, that when he used to get in elevators, you all know that at academic meetings we wear these name badges so people can read our name. They don't have to remember who we are. We could read it uh, sometimes not very subtly. Um, and he, he, he would talk about how in the old days he'd get in an elevator 
Um, and some young scholar would see his name on his name badge and get very nervous and awkward because he was such, you know, this is Lyman Porter. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And uh, very occasionally they would introduce themselves, but usually not because Lyman Porter was such a big deal. You, you just didn't do that because um, he was so important. Um, but then, as you, I think many people in the room know, with academia, with scholarly work, people do foundational work, but uh, research moves on. And over the decades, people read the newer research. They don't read the older research on which that research is based, usually unless they have a special interest. So over time, you go from being a very famous person to the younger students not reading your work anymore because they're reading the work that built on your work. And Port, still going to the meetings, he was telling the story about how now when he went in the elevator, people would see his name and the young ones didn't react. Their body language was very different. They weren't reading Lyman Porter anymore as part of their PhD qualification. And unlike a lot of other people um, who once that happens, they stay home, they don't go to the meetings anymore, they grumble about how the field's gone downhill <laughs> and everything is bad. Um, Port just wasn't like that. He always went to the meetings because he wanted to attend sessions, he wanted to learn, he had people to meet and things to learn. He was never about the glory. He was always about the people and what the scholarship and what he could learn. And, and to me, that really represents the best of what I think, not only as an ideal for myself, but for UCI as well. Um, as many of you know, the President of the United States spoke at our commencement a while ago, and he used this expression that UCI was super underappreciated. And to me, that really also just represents what Port contributed. He would contribute, he cared, he did the best work, and if other people didn't recognize it, fine. It wasn't, wasn't a concern to him. Second, um, I want to speak about uh, one of his foundational contributors that was now the Paul Mirage School, um, something he would not be so arrogant as to mention himself. Um, the school, in particular in the university, has recently been given a lot of uh, national and even international recognition, New York Times last week, about uh, the school's case that we have the highest percentage of women faculty member of any business school in the world. Um, and this campus is one of the most diverse campuses for a high-end research university. And this is something that Port did. Okay? He is responsible for this. Um, the, as it was, the Graduate School of Administration back in the 1970s also had the highest percentage of women faculty member in a business school. And this is way back when, when women were very rare in business schools. Um, and Port would never characterize himself this way, but he, he, to me, is a feminist, a classic American West pioneer feminist, the kind that in Wyoming get, were the first ones to give women the vote, because Port's the kind of guy that always wanted to hire the best person. He always wanted the best performer and he always wanted to promote the best person. And he didn't care what you looked like or anything like that. If you did the best work, he was interested in hiring you. You drop that 12th baby and then go right back out and plow the field again, he wants to hire you. <laughs> and because of that, gee whiz, a whole lot of people that do good work turned out to be female and Asian um, or other ethnic minorities. Um, he would never have characterized or even sought to have that sort of demographic outcome, but because he always was focused on merit and the best person, that's the outcome that he produced that UCI is still taking credit for. So he really is my ideal of, of how to build a great institution um, without fear or favor. So now um, what I want to do is I'm going to introduce, actually we, we have... Um, General uh, Leon Laporte, who's joining us via video. So I'm going to stand to the side here. And uh, Leon Laporte, General Leon Laporte, who was at, in charge of the command in, in Korea um, before he retired, he can't be here with us today, but he did tape a short message for us. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, oh sound. I've known Lyman for nearly 40 years. I've known him in many capacities, first as the Dean of the Graduate School of Administration when I was a student from 1975 to 1977. As a professor, I took several of his classes. As a mentor, and primarily as a friend. Um, as a Dean of the Graduate School of Administration in the old social science tower, I remember him managing providing the vision and leadership for a young school that was uh, seeking its 
played in the academic uh, realm. Um, I was the president of the Graduate School Graduate Student Association and had the opportunity to sit in many of the faculty meetings and see him as he provided that leadership and that vision to uh, the rest of the faculty and staff. I enjoyed taking so many of his classes because they were so relevant to what was going on in the workplace and in my organizations. Many of the lessons that I learned in the classroom, I took and applied when I was an assistant professor at the Military Academy at West Point and more importantly in my career in the Army. Um, Lionel was a mentor. He was a mentor from a scholarly standpoint, uh, coaxing me to, uh, to expand my horizons and uh, pursue further academic interests. And equally, uh, as uh, an athlete, uh, he and I and Joe McGuire had many spirited uh, racquetball games down in the old uh, gymnasium, all of his friends. Um, I will remember him most as a friend. For 40 years, he never forgot uh, uh, our friendship. Always uh, was contacting me, asking me how I was doing. Came to visit me at the military academy, which was a highlight. And then came to me uh, when I was uh, in the National Training Center in Boston, California. He came and spent two days with me. And for those of you who have been in Boston, California, that's a Herculean effort to uh, come in, into the middle of Mojave Desert and watch a bunch of soldiers train uh, for deployment to Iraq. Uh, but he was a trooper when I got him up at 4 o'clock in the morning and we went out and, and watched and, uh, and monitored the, the training that went on during the, uh, uh, the mock battles. And then sat through the after action reviews and where we did a, an analysis of what happened and what didn't happen. Um, he was very impressed and thought that uh, the adult learning model we were using in the Army was uh, very appropriate. So I have very, very fond memories of Lyman, and I'll keep that in my mind uh, in the future. Judy and I want again uh, express our condolences to Merit and the family. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Professor Milt Hockel. He's the president of, of the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, Ohio eminent scholar and professor emeritus at Bowling Green State. He's also a member with Lyman Porter of the PSYOP Foundation and the Summit Group. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, I'm going to start by um, finishing the list that uh, Jim started, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Uh, there are bound to be other Boy Scouts in this audience as, as well, uh, and there's a set of values there that I think pervaded everything I knew about Port. I first met him 50 years ago and one month ago this year, that is in 1965, at a meeting of the American Psychological Association in Chicago. Uh, I was a second year graduate student. Uh, I uh, attended some workshops for Division 14 uh, and at lunch with a, a fellow graduate student, uh, we sat way down on the end of a table leaving plenty of room for the professionals, the guys with the ties and everything, uh, to, to be able to schmooze among themselves because we were just a couple of outsiders, newbies and so on. Uh, and then some professional looking guy, a guy with a tie, uh, came wandering by and sat down with us. Uh, we instantly recognized Lyman Porter's name tag uh, and he spent the lunch time with us. Uh, it was a, just a fabulous lunch. Uh, I was deeply uh, struck by Port's warmth and humility, uh, most particularly because he was already famous in 1965. Uh, we read everything that he had written. He came to sit with us, it uh, really deeply impressed me. Uh, that was the first encounter in a countless uh, set of observations. And this afternoon I want to talk about just three different categories of observation uh, that I had over these, these past five decades. Uh, first one concerns Port's pro-social advocacy. 
Um, he became president of Division 14 of APA, the Industrial Psychology Division, uh, in the 70s. Uh, but on the way up for that, uh, and in 1970 at the APA meeting in Washington, D.C., a newly minted Ph.D. from Ohio State University, where I was then on the faculty, uh, Anne Levy Hussein, introduced a resolution from the floor. We had a one-hour business meeting followed by a social hour with cocktails, and so everybody wanted to get through the, the, the business meeting to the cocktails. You, you understand the drill there. Uh, so. Uh, the resolution was introduced from the floor. Nobody on the executive committee knew that it was coming. And it called for the Division of uh, Industrial and Organizational Psychology to become engaged in matters of public policy and social issues. This unexpected new business item turned out to be quite controversial. Uh, some thought it to be revolutionary and seditious. Uh, others thought it was overdue and a no-brainer. Uh, after a lot of contentious debate and a straw vote that took so long as to delay the social hour by 30 minutes, uh, it was referred to an ad hoc, ad hoc committee which Port chaired. Uh, it eventually recommended a bylaws change to create a standing public policy and social issues committee. That committee eventually uh, created a pro bono, pro bono technical assistance demonstration project for the National Association of secondary school principals. It was Port's uh, light but firm hand on the tiller that na navigated all of the, uh, the, the emotion, the difficulties of that time, uh, and put Division 14 on a very constructive path. By 1985, there were projects in all 50 states bring a 1,000 school districts. Most projects were collaborative, multi-district uh, multi or statewide efforts. Follow-up research published in the Journal of Applied Psychology affirmed the validity of the program. It set Division 14 on a path that has uh, blossomed very nicely in recent decades. The second domain of Port's influence is in publications. He's, of course, well known for his texts and for his monographs. Uh, what is less well known is that he edited the annual review of psychology for 21 volumes uh, with Mark Rosenzweig from 1974 through 1994. It's very easy to trace the growth of our field uh, inspecting the tables of contents over that interval. In the earliest years, there might be one review chapter out of 20 chapters dealing with our field. Uh, then it, it broadened out to several chapters per volume. Uh, and since then, since Port and uh, editorship ended, uh, Port and we have witnessed the launch just a year ago of the annual review of organizational psychology and organizational behavior. Uh, it's a new annual volume of the similar character to the previous ones, summarizing research in fields, but now we have our whole entire volume. Its editor, Fred Morgison, interviewed Port and Ben Schneider, who's here in the audience uh, with us today, about the development of the field, an interview that you can watch on a YouTube video, uh, and the thoughtfulness and charm shown there uh, by Port is so readily evident also in his SIAP presidential biography, which is on a website for Division 14. Uh, a couple of the quotes that you may have seen up here uh, come from that source. A uh, third domain is management education. Uh, Port succeeding, succeeded in gaining full accreditation for UC Irvine's fledgling school and graduate programs quite quickly uh, with the new school. That brought him into contact with leaders of American Assembly of Collegiate Schools of Business. Uh, so when they decided it was time to evaluate the state of their art, they recruited Port. He signed on for what became a three-year international examination of viewpoints, opinions, and objective data. A publication of Porter and McKibben's Management, Education, and Development in 1988 was welcomed for its frank and candid assessment. It noted, for instance, that graduates were weak in the soft skills, things like leadership, working in teams, and social interaction. It also described graduates as narrowly trained specialists, unable to integrate their knowledge, their technical knowledge, to solve practical problems. It provoked a full range of reactions from defensiveness and grumbling on one hand to creative, creativity and innovation on another. Most crucially, it solidified the growing understanding that grade point averages and credit hour totals 
are weak proxies for direct evidence of what really matters, applying one's knowledge and skills to solve problems and to meet the challenges of working productively in organizations. That's one of the roots of the whole fantasy that we can use achievement tests to leave no child left behind uh, in recent legislation. Um, I want to close this uh, 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 set of comments by coming back to that initial meeting 50 years ago uh, and say that really impressed me, but what impressed me much more deeply was our second meeting. Uh, at the outset, I mentioned meeting him 50 years ago. The second meeting was in New York City a week later, again at an APA convention. Uh, when we saw each other, Pork recognized me and called me by name. Uh, nothing like that had ever happened, and that's the meeting with Port that I will for sure never forget. Uh, as I got to know him over the years, I began to understand that Port's greeting me in New York was representative of how he related to everyone. We've heard that amply already this afternoon. It typified his strong sense of enjoyment, working with others collaboratively. He was a superb leader and a superb collaborator. He listened well. He could disagree without being disagreeable. Our field's growth and vitality owes so much to his grace and wisdom. Uh, clearly, he was one of the people who make the place. Uh, he was a giant among us. So now I would like to ask Ed Lawler to come up, and another giant among us. Uh, this is one of Port's students from the, the Berkeley years. Good afternoon. Did everything, but never at the cost of others. Always benefited others. He did not climb over others. He helped others climb. Simply astonishing how much impact on so many people, and so kindly and quietly. Port has been an amazing role model for how to be a scholar, how to study relevant issues, how to teach and mentor, how to be a person. I experienced Port as a caring and very considerate person, and of course, a leader in the field. Not just brilliant and productive, but also down to earth, interested in advancing understanding, in particularly meaningful ways, and so very decent. I love that he encouraged full, well-rounded lives, even as he must have worked tirelessly. We've lost a truly great man. I learned so much from him in our brief encounters, and of course, not all his work. He was a true role model psychologist, a scholar, a lovely, lovely person. And he was at the top of the field in terms of grace and humility. Port represents the very best in our profession. He's an icon. I think my expectation, a bit unrealistic, is that he would be with us forever. What a gentleman. What a friend. I treasure the memories. Port's greetings set a welcome tone. And as we all know so well, he went on to become one of the people who make the place. PSYOP's growth and vitality, and vitality owes so much to his grace and wisdom. Incredibly sad, one of the founders of our field, and certainly a, if not the major bridge between the IO psychology world and the OB world. These are all independent comments that came to me in response to a note that I sent out to friends and acquaintances of ports. You can't help but to be overwhelmed by their consistency and the depiction that they make of a wonderful human being. There's nothing much I can add to them. Just one comment. A life well lived has ended, but not be forgotten, because he's made life better for all of us. This is especially true for me. He mentored me from graduate school on, and he introduced me to the love of my life, Patty, who was one of his best faculty members here, in my humble opinion. <laughs> Wonderful hire. And I'm going to turn it over to continue the UCI flow to Milt Hockle, who was one of his best star graduate students here, and he's going to talk about... I'm sorry, Rick! I've got... I've got I've, why did I say... Why did I, I have Milt Hockle on my mind. That's serious. <laughs> turn it over to... To Rick Malley, who is one of his 
our graduate students here, and you're going to talk some about what it was like to be a professor, or well, what it was like to be a professor. doctoral student. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Ed. Well, being asked to uh, speak on behalf of Port's uh, Irvine doctoral students is a bit of a daunting task, and I'm not sure I'm the right person to do it, to be honest. I was not Port's first doctoral student. That was John Van Manen and I'm pretty sure I wasn't his best doctoral student. That, come to think of it, is probably also John Van Manen. But <laughs> I had the great good fortune to come to Irvine. When it was then the Graduate School of Administration and to enter the PhD program in its infancy. It's no idle boast for me to say that I could talk about for hours about my wonderful memory support and my time in the doctoral program, but Joan asked me not to do that. So I'll try and keep my comments brief, and for your sake, I hope I can do it. <laughs> how to begin and how to narrow down my memory support. I thought one approach might be to say a few words about the program, the doctoral program. Port designed the doctoral program at Irvine, and I think the characteristics of the program say something about the character of the man who designed it and the things he valued. So let me mention briefly three characteristics. One way I would characterize the program it was challenging. Now, I think that's something every PhD student in America would say about their PhD program, so that's not unique to uh, Irvine. What is unique is the way in which it was challenging. It wasn't challenging because the faculty said impossibly high hurdles or intimidated the students or were very difficult to deal with. It was challenging because if you worked with Port, you had a high standard to live up to. Port led by example. He was a role model and he was passionate about research on behavior and organizations and about higher education, and his passion was simply contagious. Back in the day, there was a concept that was introduced into the literature by Robert Merton and extended to the organizational field by Alvin Goldner, and they said the roles and identities of people and organizations could be characterized as either cosmopolitan or local. Locals focused their attention and activities on the immediate institution in which they served. They were active in the governance of their school or their college. Uh, in contrast, cosmopolitans focus on the wider world outside the confines of their school and campus, such as professional associations. In popular usage, one was either a cosmopolitan or a local. As we've learned this afternoon, Port was both. Uh, Port taught us by example. If we were doctoral students, it's very important to get involved in your college, your school, your campus, but also in the professional associations outside your school. In retrospect, it would have been a lot easier for the students of uh, Fort if he'd been either a local or a cosmopolitan. And many things can be said about Port, but one thing was for certain. He was a tough act to follow. And I, for one, am thankful because I think trying made me a better professor throughout my career. Second characteristic, the doctoral program was independence and autonomy. Irvine was a very small school when I first came, and they didn't have a very extensive curriculum. Uh, set of classes as you would be found in an older, more traditional uh, school. So it meant that a lot of your studies were self-directed, independent studies. In designing the program, I think Port knew that self-direction and self-motivation would serve us well when we graduated and entered the academic profession. And an example of the independence and autonomy Port encouraged came when my fellow doctoral students and I took our required course in research methodology. We finished thinking that one course was hardly sufficient to do justice to such an important topic, and we wanted to organize our own self-directed second seminar in research methodology. And we weren't necessarily interested in a faculty-driven course because, quite frankly, we thought a faculty member would slow us down. No arrogance there. <laughs> we proposed a student-led seminar, and Port not only approved it, but it actively encouraged it. But the independence and autonomy uh, court offered could be a two-edged sword if you were a doctoral student. Take the doctoral dissertation, for example. If, I suspect in many doctoral programs it comes time to take, undertake your dissertation research, you go to your major professor and he or she assigns you a topic to study. Court didn't uh, work that way. Court expected the students to identify a research topic of their very own and the, with a small provision that it make a contribution to knowledge in the field. Identifying your own research topic and also one that contributed to the advanced knowledge was no small challenge, but again, what wonderful preparation when you entered the professions of professor. Now, the final characteristic of the program I'll mention, and this may have been the secret sauce, I think, uh, was informality. 
I don't recall that Port was ever Professor Porter, Dr. Porter, or Dean Porter. He was just plain Port. Port never put on airs, and it was some time when, after I came here that I realized what an important figure he was in the field because he simply never let on. One tradition, if you were a doctoral student of Port, came on Saturdays in the office. If Port was in town working in the office on Saturday, which he often was, it meant two things. One, you were there too. And two, he would take you to lunch at Little John's. And Little John's, as I recall, was a hamburger joint, maybe in Costa Mesa, I'm not quite sure where it was. But outside the office, the conversation was more informal. And I think it was at these lunches that we really learned the craft of research what the profession was all about, and future challenges we would face. And Port made the program fun, too. He liked to laugh and joke, although if truth be told, some of his puns were pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you agree, Meredith. But <laughs> he made it fun to work, and he loved every minute of it. You worked very hard. So I had the great good fortune to be a student of Port's. He was a teacher, a role model, a mentor, and a friend, although ex maybe less so during football season when USC was about to play Oregon, uh, USC football being one of his other great passions. So. <laughs> uh, Port's influence on my career didn't end when I graduated. Uh, there are a number of times during my career opportunities presented themselves, for example, to be an external examiner at a foreign university or to write a chapter for a book. And when I analyzed those opportunities, I could see Port's fingerprints all over them. So he mentored me throughout my career, and I'm thankful for that. So how to sum up, later in my career I was asked to write a chapter for Art Perdian's theory in Management Laureates. And I entitled my chapter, Finding Myself in the Right Place at the Right Time. And to me that says it all. The right place was the Graduate School of Administration, and the right time was early in its history when Port was active on the faculty. As much as I'll miss Port, I celebrate his life, his contributions to the field, and the fact that I was able to be a small part of them. And I know my fellow Irvine doctoral students feel the same as I do. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Charles, Charlie Leisure, Leisure, I'm sorry, here today representing Port's grandchildren. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as the only person without a PhD to be up on stage today, please excuse any lack of eloquence in my remarks. Uh, so, as, as Rick mentioned, uh, I'm uh, Lyman Porter's second eldest grandson. I would like to be begin by thanking all of you for joining us here today. It means so much to our family to see gathered here the many people to whom my grandfather meant so much. My remarks, which reflect my own views along with those of my older brother John, will attempt to give you some sense of who my grandfather was to his family. And to take an aside from the script, I think it's interesting that so many of the themes uh, that others have hit upon throughout their remarks are, are echoed across his family life as well. Uh, before getting into my uh, own remarks, I would like to give a special thanks to all of the speakers uh, who, have, uh, who have made their thoughtful remarks over the course of the day. Uh, they have immeasurably enhanced my appreciation and respect for my grandfather's life. If I thought I had a lot to live up to uh, before today, <laughs> I think the uh, task ahead has expanded somewhat uh, over the course of the last hour. It would be difficult in these brief remarks to relate all the ways in which he impacted my life, but were he here, he would advise me to be concise. I think he would say something like, get to the point, Chaz, <laughs> uh, as he did often. So. Uh, I'll, I'll use a, a, a vignette that I think we'll all remember uh, him for in the family. So each interaction with my grandfather invariably started the same way. He always had two or three questions for each person, questions he had clearly been saving for that exact moment in time. These weren't the normal questions people tend to ask. What's going on? How's school? How's work? No. His questions seemed to get right down to the core of whatever was most important in your life at that moment. The questions attempted, I think, to give a firm and yet gentle prod to what could be an otherwise complacent mind, imploring it to take in the initiative of original thought. The questions always seemed to demand of my mind something insightful, something that required me to speak in my own voice, uh, building a unique thought out of my individual perspective and experience. For a young person, and I say young because he started this practice when I was about five years old, uh, 
having an adult, especially uh, one as eminent as he was, truly care about what you think ignites a certain confidence of expression that starts to give a person a keen sense of self. I will never know whether or not this was his purpose. I like to think that it was. Uh, but at the very least, I think in some small corner of his mind, uh, he was trying to keep track of everything about me, building answer upon answer over time to form a complete view of my character and personality. Over the years, I'm quite sure that he arrived at a better idea of who I am than I have or will ever have myself. As he often did, I will pose two questions to you today and attempt to answer them according to my grandfather's example as I saw it. Question one, how do we cultivate in people an intellectual curiosity that gives them an interest in and an appreciation for the vast complexity of the world in which we live? My grandfather spent much of his life traveling the world in an attempt to build a well-ordered understanding of the human experience. His adventures in the pursuit of knowledge took him many places, often in the capacity of educator, but always in an effort to build a more holistic understanding of people and their motivations. His journeys took him many places over the years, to London in 1938 on the eve of World War II, to Copenhagen when my mother was a small child, to China just after it reopened, to Korea to see the demarcated zone, and so many other places besides. He brought his perspective back into his living room and to his dinner table, and, uh, and his conversation was infused with the qualities of many cultures and civilizations, and he painted for us a tantalizing picture of the world outside. He helped us develop a comfort with a great variety of people and places, and as a result, we have gone off and out to live among them as he did himself. His culminating journey in this respect was not even three years ago when at age 82, he and my grandmother traveled halfway around the world to visit me in Hong Kong and my brother in Korea. I very much hope it's see him that we are doing the best to live according to his example. My grandfather appreciated and understood many things, and he taught us to do the same. He had a keen sense of history, which my brother and I both pursued in school. I somewhat less so. My brother's getting a PhD. I'm just a business guy, so, you know. We have the professional and academic stuff covered at this point. Uh, so uh, his, his interests were not also not limited to academic pursuits. He had a great appreciation for college athletics, as many people have mentioned, uh, and a love for football at any level. Uh, I think the best Christmas present that we ever gave him was a ticket to the national championship between USC and Texas in 2006. Uh, he was speechless when he opened it up, and I don't think that we ever achieved that before in any other setting. So <laughs> it, was, uh, it, was, it was a great moment for us, and USC lost, and we all cried. But, uh, you know, we, we, we moved on, and I didn't go there, so I was fine with it. Uh, he, he loved the tension of those moments and the contest of will between powerful forces, and I think for him, football was the most accessible arena he found for this outside the classroom over the years. My second question is one that I don't have a complete answer to yet, but I think is important in light of today's ceremony. What is my grandfather's legacy, and how can we best remember it in the years ahead? It will take me a great deal of time to develop a concrete answer to this question, and what we have all participated in here today is a crucial first step amongst many. In this moment, however, my observation is the following. It remains for us now, we who are left to follow his example, to reach back into the essence of his life to find those principles by which we still might live. In doing so, we might hope to find those elements of our better nature found, <clears throat> sorry, founded upon a humility of spirit and a respect for knowledge that will give us an appreciation <clears throat> not only for the world, but for all those wonderfully unique human perspectives that can be found within it. Long may we remember a man who, simply by asking the right questions, and truly listening to the answers allowed us to find our own voice. He inspired in us a certain clarity of thought and confidence of expression that allowed us to cultivate a sense of self that is worthy of the esteem of our fellow man. I can think of no better tribute nor greater honor than to see a group of his esteemed students, colleagues, and friends gather not to mourn his passing, but rather to celebrate his life. On behalf of my family, and all those who knew my grandfather best throughout his long life, I thank you for joining us here today. It will allow us, many years from now, to endeavor to cherish and forever remember the man he was and the impact he had on us all.
Thank you. I'd now like to uh, introduce my Uncle Bill, who is uh, Lyman Porter's uh, son. Bill. So, unlike you know everybody that's that's up here, I'm probably going to not use the mic because I'm assuming you can hear me. That I've got one of the biggest voices I think on the planet, so <laughs> I'll, I'll go without it. Um, first of all, have no fear. I'm going to definitely keep this very brief. That was the direction, so um, I'll definitely do that. Um, definitely on on behalf of my entire family. Thank you for coming. So. A little bit of thought and how to keep it brief. And uh, I just kind of came up with the concept of, you know, five words to describe my dad. Um, so I'll just run through those. I, and I think, you know, the evidence is pretty clear here today that, that these are definitely words to describe who he was. So the first one is collegiality. Um, he lived it. Uh, Excuse me. The second one, the second word is mentorship. You know, whether it was a son, whether it was a daughter, a colleague, you know, my dad was a good mentor. And third, I think Charlie touched on some of this, but his global mindset. You know, from a very early age, I, I recognize that my dad, you know, had sort of this global view of the world. And uh, I think it came out in... You know, in all his opinions, it was never coming from one side or, you know, from one point of view. So, um, fourth uh, is, is more of a term rather than a word, but it's well-informed. Um, for those, you know, who knew my dad, he was probably happy when he had 12 newspapers out in front of him <laughs> and, uh, and an afternoon with nothing but free time. So... Um, he's definitely, you know, well informed. Um, you know, and last but not least, um, you know, my dad came from Midwest roots, and uh, you know, he 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 let you know that. And uh, you know, while he had this global perspective, he really was grounded in his Midwest roots. So you know, with that, you know, thanks again for coming. Obviously, I kept it brief, but. Uh, you know, I also want to leave you with one, one quote I always heard my dad, you know, uh, say many times over. And, and that was, actions speak louder than words. So, thank you. Okay, well thank you all once again for joining us here today. And Meredith has asked that... Um, I just mentioned that you please take a moment to greet her and the rest of the family at the reception. We've, we're going to have a reception out in the in the lobby, and um, Jerry Mandel Jazz Band will be there, and they will be joined by a special guest. Our first speaker today, Jim McGaugh, is going to join them. So we'll see. That's going to be a great a great uh, additional uh, little bit of celebration out there in the lobby. So please. Stop and say hi to Meredith and the rest of the family, and thank you again for joining us. So let's uh, retire to the, to the lobby.